Thank you for joining the fourth Geo Google program virtual meetup focused on land degradation. I'm Sam Atkinson, General Manager of EO Data Science, and I'll be your host. EO Data Science is an Australian company specialising in operationalising earth observations to answer specific questions. We're fortunate to have an excellent working relationship with the Google Earth Engine team, and we are even more fortunate to be providing support to the Geo Google program. Our vision for these meetups is for projects focused on similar or overlapping themes to share knowledge, ask questions of each other, and importantly, to build professional networks. Um, travel and conferences, are of course, are, are nearly impossible due to COVID, but we want to enable as much sharing of ideas as possible. With this objective in mind, the structure of this meetup is kind of like a panel discussion. Each of our projects will present for five minutes, followed by questions and answers. Then we will take the opportunity to ask as many questions of the panelists as possible in a moderated conversation. To ask a question, please use the comments box um, and please do ask questions and ask them at any time. We'll do our best to get to all of them. Um, and it, it is important that your questions are being put to the panelists, not mine. Yours are gonna be far more relevant and mine will potentially be boring. The Geo Google program has an amazing global reach with projects on every continent. In these meetups, we are celebrating the diversity of objectives, uh, methods, perspectives, and people that you can only really get with a global conversation. And as we engage in this discussion, it is this diversity I feel that offers us the greatest opportunity to learn, but also to share knowledge. To enable networking from these events, please look at the speaker and attendee bios that you would have received a link to in the invite to this meetup. If you haven't created your own bio, um, and you want to still, um, you still can. If there is a bio you see and you want to talk to that person, please reach out to them. In this meetup, our presenters and panelists are Mariano Gonzalez Roglic from the, uh, sorry, from Conservation International presenting on Trends Earth. Rafael uh, Mong from the Ministry of Environment and Energy of Costa Rica presenting on tackling deforestation and forest degradation in Costa Rica using Google Earth Engine. Nick Murray from James Cook University in Australia presenting on REMAP, which is the Remote Ecosystem Monitoring and Assessment Pipeline. And Xiao Xiong Li from the Aerospace Information Research Institute in China presenting on land degradation neutrality. Um, Alejandro Coca Costa Castro, I should say, from the Instit Instituto Geografico Augustin Codazzi presenting on multi temporal change detection. And our final presenter will be Charles Mwangi from the Kenyan Space Agency presenting on monitoring for information and decisions using space technology. We're also pleased to have with us again, um, Doug Kripe, who is the Senior Scientific Advisor at GEO, and Noel Gorlick, who is a Senior Software Engineer at Google and also the Google, one of the Google Earth Engine co-founders. Noel, would you like to say a few words from Google's perspective? Sure, thanks. Um, as Sam said, I'm Noel Gorlick and I'm one of the founders of Google Earth Engine. Um, we here at Google are happy to provide the technical infrastructure for these projects. And I'm here as an observer to see if there are any common issues or opportunities to improve the back end to try to help unblock any projects that might have scaling problems with the platform. With that said, I'm looking forward to learning more about the projects. Thank you. Thanks, Noel. Um, Doug, from the Group on Earth Observations, would you like to say a few words? Yes, thank you, Sam. Um, so I'm, uh, as Sam said, I'm Doug Kripe from the GEO Secretariat. Uh, and I just want to say a few words about the GEO uh, end of, of this program. Um, some of you are probably not familiar uh, with what GEO is about. So um, GEO is the Group on Earth Observations um, that represents a partnership of governments and organizations across the world that envisages a future where decisions and actions for the benefit of humankind are informed by coordinated, comprehensive, and sustained Earth observations. So the group on Earth observations, as the name suggests, is, is uh, concerned with opening up access uh, to Earth observations, whether that be from satellites or from in situ observations, marine observations, and so forth. So all platforms. Um, and the mission of GEO is to connect the demand for sound and timely environmental information with the supply of data and information about the Earth that's collected through observing systems that are made available by the GEO community. 
And so uh, in, in so doing, GEO works to unlock the power of Earth observations by facilitating their accessibility and application to global decision making within and across many different domains. So uh, this program fits very nicely into this uh, objective uh, of GEO, and I'm looking forward to hearing how you're putting Earth observations to work. Thank you. Thanks, Doug. Glad to have you here with us again. Now onto the presentations. First, we have Mariano Gonzalez Roglic from the from Conservation International presenting on Trends.Earth. Over to you, Mariano. Hello, everybody. Thanks, Sam, for the introduction. And uh, looking forward to to learning more about all these projects. And um, so, what what I'm going to be talking about today is briefly the the project that we we propose to do for for this program with uh, Google Earth Engine and. Geo and Geo Data Science, which is called Supporting Land Degradation Neutrality Through Cloud Monitoring Platform Trends on Earth uh, 2.0. So this project is building on the work that we at CI have been doing on, on Trends on Earth, this platform for assessing land degradation, but with some new partners. So in this case, we're working, well, of course, with the UNCCD, but also with CSRO, ESA, NASA, uh, as key partners of this project. Next slide, please. So, well, I, I think the, this slide for most of you is it's pretty obvious, but land degradation is, is, is an issue that it's of, of global importance, given that it affects a significant uh, portion of the land, and it has impacts for local communities. Over a billion people are directly affected by land degradation. The estimates are even higher if you measure indirect, uh, indirect affected people. And then it also has the impact for, for climate change. The land degradation is a significant contributor to, to CO2 emissions. Um, next slide. So what we did with Trans on Earth, Trans on Earth is a tool that has been around for, well, it had a different name at first, but around four years. Uh, and what we decided to do was to support the, the UNCCD, the United Nations Convention to Combat the Certification and uh, to uh, the signatory countries of the convention to do the assessments of land degradation for monitoring, for reporting, and more importantly, for planning how to address that. Um, land degradation is, is also one of the SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals 15.3.1. So by, by addressing this need, we were providing a solution to country members in two of their, of their report, monitoring and, and reporting needs. So Transfer Earth, in its current form, it's a free and open source tool for assessing land condition. Uh, we're using, we're following the framework of the Sustainable Development Goals. So there's three sub-indicators that users can assess uh, with this tool. It's changes in land cover, changes in primary productivity, in, in land productivity, and uh, changes in soil organic carbon. And with the tool, you, you can assess the baselines and then track progress. And what we did is in order to, to simplify um, access to, to data and, and to the methods, uh, we we provide in the tool global data sets, so uh, global land cover data sets, global primary productivity data sets, global soil organic carbon data sets, uh, and also all the methods to synthesize that into the indicators that need to be uh, reported on. Uh, so the tool comes with pre-populated with global data sets, but also there's a recognition, of course, that global data sets are not the solution to everything. So in many cases, countries or provinces have their own data. Uh, and that will be much more suitable. So the, the, the work around that we find for these was to make Trans on Earth a QGIS plugin. Uh, so the user interacts with the tool uh, through QGIS, which is a, a free and open source software. Um, but it, all the calculations are run when you're using global data sets in Google Earth Engine. So, so we made this, this link between our tool and Google Earth Engine to make sure to, that we are able to use the amazing computing power that GE provides uh, to simplify the, these calculations, but at the same time, uh, allowing the flexibility of running the analysis locally. And in this way, uh, allow us to sort of overcome the issue of limited bandwidth in many areas, which we, we knew was an issue. So this model worked really well for the, for the first phase. Uh, next slide, please. So since we launched Trends on Earth, uh, we, we worked again very closely with the UNCCD. We trained over 120 countries in person with, with regional workshops. And since then, we, we, our statistics show that over 190 territories, some of, most of them are countries, but some of them are uh, not formally countries or some, some uh, other form of administrative unit, and over 3,600 users. 
uh, these, of course, for, for Google, for Google Earth Engine is, is nothing, but, but for a tool like ours, it's a significant number of, of users distributed throughout the world. What you can see there in that map is uh, users uh, counted as per number of users per city throughout the world, sorry. Um, and then in recognition of how, how useful Transorat has been to, to do these assessments, the GEO uh, SDG group provided us, they gave us an award uh, last year, which has been a, a great reward for us uh, from, from the group of Earth Observations. Next slide. So um, what I mentioned is sort of what Trends on Earth, how it started. Right now we're going through uh, as part of another project called Tools for LDN, which is a partnership with um, Land PKS, a mobile application, Woke, and we're, we're working on some improvements on the tool. We're improving the indicators, adding indicators that are more sensitive to, to low and high biomass uh, regions, also increasing the spatial resolution of these indicators. Uh, we're going to be providing access to our data through a mobile application, Land PKS. And so we're really excited about that. And then it, that application collects data, which then you can access through, through the tool. So we're, we're making sure that the, the approach is not, I mean, it's still going to be very top down, given that there's, it's, it's, remote sensing data that most of the data is coming from, but we're trying to make sure that we provide, uh, that the user has the option of using contextual information. Uh, and then we're adding indicators as well to measure, uh, to assess the linkages between land degradation, drought, and resilience. This is to report to other strategic objectives of, of, the, of the UNCCD. And we're going to be pilot testing these, these uh, indicators and these methods in Colombia. We're still having work the actual on the ground activities for due to COVID, but we're planning to start early next year. Next slide. So what is it that we propose to do as part of, of this project, as part of this collaboration with uh, the GEO and, and GE and EO Data Science? So we, we saw that the model that um, we use, which is a QGS plugin, served perfectly the needs that we had, and we see a lot of value in that. But we see that there's there, there's moving forward, we, we need a web-based version of this. So this is the main sort of change that we're proposing to do. In terms of the analytics, the indicators, the data sets, we don't really propose many changes. I mean, we're already updating those as part of the Tools for LDN project. But the main change that we want to do is develop this web-based tool that will allow the users to do quick calculations on the fly, see the maps, uh, so do data visualization on the fly, not having to wait for a few minutes till the last is completed, run the analysis, and then provide the, the tabular uh, and the map outputs. So th the main the main shifts that you're going to see as a user is not having to rely solely on QGS, but having the web version to, to do the calculations. Uh, next slide. And I think I'm, I'm running out of time. I just wanted to mention the team. So of course, the Trans Earth team, that it's, uh, it's a key part of this. And then we have Jeff Masek from NASA, Mark Paganini from ESA, Sarah Minelli from the UNCCD, and Neil Sims from CSR Australia. Uh, next slide, and that's all I have. Um, oh, sorry, I, I meant to put here my, phone, my email address. Uh, I guess I mixed up the slide. But yeah, feel free to reach out if you have any questions, comments, suggestions, areas that you want to help us improve or that you think we should address. So yeah, that's all, Sam. Excellent. Thanks, Mariana. Um, I, I have a few questions, but I think you actually answered them um, through there. So I'll ask you about, so one thing I noticed certainly in kind of using the QGIS version of trends.earth was that, well, first of all, it looks neat and works well, um, but your documentation is fantastic as well, which is you know surprisingly good for kind of these sorts of applications that the community puts together or individual organisations put together, which is which is great. Um, and so I suppose having had that experience of really thinking through um, the the user journey and, and what people need to do, and of course having of uh, done that. Can you share any kind of experiences or insights that might help all the other projects who are working towards those sorts of outputs? Um, just around, you know, what things to think about or, you know, how much effort it actually takes to, to pull together um, those things? Yeah, sure. Um, I'll start with the last one. In terms of effort, a lot, <laughs> and, and but it's super rewarding, I think, in particular, 
given that our project is very much time to tied to reporting to SDGs and, and to the UNCCD, there's there's a deadline there that, that countries need to follow. So that meant that we really have to push to meet those deadlines because otherwise our help will be sort of irrelevant for the next four years. So so that that was a great motivation for us. Um, and then in terms of lessons learned, I think one of them, when we first started with the tool, of course, we had an idea of what we wanted to do, but we, we didn't really know how it was going to be received. I mean, we know that there are so many tools, data sets that are being provided all the time. Uh, I'm, I'm a scientist, and sometimes scientists, we create things that we think are cool, but we're a little bit detached from the user. Uh, and I think one of the, the things that we learned early on with Trends of Earth and that we try to to sort of embed throughout the, the, the process and the tool, and we try, still try to do that, is always keep in mind the end user. It's like you could produce the most amazing data set and tool, but if it's not addressing a need that the user has, it's really not going to have that much impact. And the reason why we always put, for example, this Excel screenshot here is because the users that we were targeting were not really very technically savvy. And so we, we thought, oh, doing an area calculation and the summary, it's super, it's easy. We don't even need to do that. Well, that was the one thing that they asked the most. So really touching with the user, making sure that you address their needs. I, I think that that is the one advice that we give everybody. Yeah. Excellent. Um, no, that's great. Really good insights. Um, I was also going to ask as well about how you manage um, kind of user data privacy. So when a, da when, a, when a user brings their own data set or particularly with a mobile application collecting data, um, how do you, I suppose, make it valuable and, and extract the value from that data, but also kind of protect um, the interests of the person who collected it and their wishes? Yeah. So in the... In, in the tool itself, uh, what we do is everything that is using local data, it's running QGIS and that never leaves the user's computer. So in that sense, geospatial data, it's always kept. Uh, and, and that was something that was made aware to us very early on. The countries are very sensitive about their own data and they don't want to share it. And uh, with companies in particular, so, so that in that sense. Then with the data collected in the field, so where LANPIC is already existed and it's an application that has been around for many years. Uh, so they have their own um, way of handling it. What we're doing is tying through the API so that the user can access either their own data with a login. So when they create data sets, they have a login or data that the users have the option of select as public. So in that case, when you select field data, you can make it public and then anyone can download it or, or you can restrict it to yourself and then use a login to download it. So yeah, again, that's a great question. I think making sure that you keep private data private is key for uh, making sure that people feel comfortable using it. Yeah. yeah, excellent. Uh, Mariano, thank you. Uh, we look forward to continuing the conversation with you, um, with the panelists, uh, other panelists in a few minutes' time. Perfect. Thank uh, you. Our next presenter is uh, Rafael Mong from the Ministry of Environment and Energy of Costa Rica, presenting on tackling deforestation and forest degradation in Costa Rica using Google Earth Engine. Rafael, over to you. Hi, thank you very much, uh, Sam. Uh, Greetings or cheers, as you say in Australia. Uh, thank you for the invitation to participate in this virtual meetup. Uh, thanks to the uh, to EO Data Science, Geo Secretariat, and Google for organizing these very interesting sessions with the representatives from all the projects under the program. Uh, my name is Rafael Monge, and I am the director of the National Center of Geoenvironmental Information at the Ministry of Environment and Energy of Costa Rica. As I only have five minutes, I also want to share with you my Twitter handle there in case you want to follow up the conversation uh, there. Uh, please, next slide. Um, first, I want to tell you that uh, Costa Rica has an official platform for coordination and institutional and sectoral integration to facilitate the management and distribution of knowledge and information regarding land cover, land use, and ecosystems. We call this platform CIMOCUTE for its acronym in Spanish. Uh, this system has been constructed in response to the need for a more comprehensive and integrated monitoring strategy, uh, which encompasses all lands and consists of several integrated subsystems that together produce consistent national scale information on the state of and changes in all land uses, land covers, and ecosystems. 
the subsystems integrate. Um, no, I was. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, the subsystems integrate field and remotely sense data to provide comprehensive information across forests, agriculture, and, and other sectors that facilitate improved uh, land use decision making and provide uh, data for a variety of national and international initiatives and reporting requirements. Uh, with the project that we presented to the GEO and GEE license program, we are building capacities and generating new methodologies to detect deforestation, forest degradation, and forest restoration to monitor and report CO2 emissions and develop an early warning system that allows generating information in the shortest possible time on illegal activities related to deforestation. Ne next slide now. Uh, more than a dozen national and international organizations have joined this effort that is expected to deliver and share new knowledge about how to best use earth observations to monitor forest dynamics in the tropics. Um, so far, all the work has been done remotely, taking advantage of the, all the functionalities that uh, technology can provide. Uh, this is the list of, of the organizations that have already been part of this process project, but we have a, this is an, an open list for uh, other organizations that may want to join us in this process nationally or internationally. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, our objectives of these projects include uh, developing and implementing an efficient pipeline for processing time series data, both optical and radar, to create maps of change, also operationalize existing and or new time series based change detection algorithms to produce highly accurate change maps to complement sample based area estimation and um, also implement algorithms in Google Earth Engine to generate forest age maps and detect uh, forest degradation. And in our area of objectives, we are planning to create an early warning system to provide near real time alerts of deforestation and also share the results with, of these projects with other countries in the region that may have similar challenges. Next slide, please. We have integrated two working groups to achieve our goals. Uh, one related to the technical development, uh, who will be working with the project in the project outputs using GE, and the other one focused on institutional arrangements, who are developing the management model uh, of the early warning system, and also who will be designing and preparing the reports of this project. Next slide. Well, detecting deforestation and forest degradation and forest destruction in Costa Rica is quite complicated because it is relatively low and scattered all around the country. As shown in the graphs, we have reduced significantly uh, our deforestation rate and the area covered with uh, secondary forests has been increasing. Costa Rica's tropical rainforest covers some 30% of the country's total surface area and regeneration rates are very fast in these areas, which increases the difficulty of detecting degradation activities. Uh, we have started our analysis with the identification of the different methodologies, data sources, and code lines that will be evaluating to better map and quantify these dynamics. Next slide, please. And finally, we, with the help of uh, Silver Carbon, we have done some benchmarking on the early warning systems of Colombia and Peru directly with the people responsible for its implementation. Uh, we had a very interesting first exchange session on November 24th of this year, and we'll be receiving their advisory for project uh, so our next steps and um, well this is just a quick preview of our project uh, thank you very much for your attention the next slide and final slide uh, i'll be happy to answer any of the questions you may have Rafael, thank you. Um, yeah, like you say, it's, it's very hard to summarize the amount of work that um, that you are doing and all of the projects are doing in five minutes. Um, so thank you um, for, for giving us that look. Um, I do have a whole pile of questions though. So um, let's start Let's start with the detection of um, deforestation um, and what you've learned, because of course there's, there's um, you know, there's a whole heap of approaches to doing that. You know, we have, you know, um, the work of Hansen, et cetera, um, as, as well as, um, you know, a number of other um, approaches depending on where you are in the world and the types of systems. So I'd, I'd love to get your thoughts on, yeah, which approaches 
uh, are most relevant for, for Costa Rica and, and how you did that evaluation and came to that conclusion? Well, thank you very much. First, I want to say that I'm more like a manager than a science in this part of the project. And I was thinking in a manager way very roughly about this and saying, well, there are some solutions out there. We just pick one and get done with it. But in the last sessions of the technical group, we have been looking at this to first, we want to look at the state of the art of the different options that are that are out there, the different data sources, because <laughs> Every day, there are new data sources or new codes or new things that we may consider for a project. And, and now, <laughs> or we have done so far a pretty good, a, a good job with a report uh, with the reports that we have been producing for the Red Strategy, for instance. But we want to increase the accuracy of these reports and uh, the information that we're getting and. We haven't studied like the use of radar data for this, for instance, and that's one one thing that we're definitely going to look at. And we're hoping that with you and other colleagues that are working in these same areas, we can identify these different methodologies, strategies, data sources, uh, put them in a matrix, and say, well, this worked like this, this worked like that, and then provide results in the end. Yeah, excellent. Um, Good, um, and I, I did have a question as well. You know, the really a, a big focus of the um, the Geo Google program is actually having an impact. Um, you know, seeing the science delivered on ground for positive outcomes. Um, of course, um, the project you're working on is a great advantage of being um, you know part of the government. So um, that. A lot of our conversations have been over the last few um, virtual meetups around, well, it's about influencing policymakers, et cetera. So, um, you know, with you um, and, and your team being um, part of the government, that's excellent. So I wanted to ask, so with that alert system in place, um, how will you determine whether deforestation is being carried out illegally or whether it is kind of legal deforestation or perhaps, you know, replanting of a plantation or something like that? Um, and then what, how do you act on that quickly to to make change? Well, uh, that's something that we also want to discover in the process. However, uh, that's a very important part of the institutional arrangements that we have to work on, not only the technical part. And this is some lesson learned from this workshop or exchange that we had with Peru and Colombia. Uh, it's not only having the information out there, it's that having this information get to the people that needs to get it and also to the, in the time that they need it. And it's, I think it would be easier for us with a smaller country than Colombia or Peru that have a lot bigger territories. And, but also the accuracy of those uh, alerts or uh, hotspots, it's important because if the accuracy is not very good, then we'll be having data that is not useful and people will be looking at things that may not we want them not to look at, uh, but this implies that the tool has to be perfection uh, in the process, and that uh, the the arrangement, what, what, how it, this gets to actual policy action, uh, has a very efficient pipeline, <laughs> like the one for the code, but also for the actions in the territory. Yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah, important points. Uh, Rafael, thank you. I uh, we'll look forward to um, talking to you soon in the panel discussion. The next presenter is Nick Murray from James Cook University um, in Townsville, um, presenting on REMAP, which is Remote Ecosystem Monitoring and Assessment Pipeline. Nick, over to you. Uh, g'day, Sam. Thanks very much. And um, yeah, thanks for inviting me to present in this um, this forum. It's just such a great group of, um, of projects, and I'm really delighted to be one of them. Um, today, I'm going to present about a, an app that we developed starting in about 2016 on, on Earth Engine. And um, the main purpose of this app is to really try to solve a problem that, that we were facing in the IUCN um, Red List of Ecosystems team of, of having to de develop reasonably similar maps all the way around the world um, for users and, um, and end users that, that didn't have any, any technical background, background in remote sensing. Um, so click ahead, thanks, Eva. <clears throat> yeah, so with this project, we were really aiming to make remote sensing accessible. Um, I'm part of a, a global team of about 10 people implementing the IUCN's Red List of Ecosystems. 
And we found that frequently uh, no map data was a, a major barrier to understanding the status of ecosystems all around the world. And often the sorts of maps that needed to be developed were using a really similar workflow and um, and could sort of be rolled into a single single pipeline of, um, of data analysis to, to try to make remote sensing accessible to a really wide range of users. Uh, forward, thanks Yvonne. So we developed Remap. Um, it's an online app uh, running in Earth Engine, running on Earth Engine, I guess. Um, and we tried to take out every single difficult step that um, that is the main barrier to, to remote sensing classifications for the sorts of user base that, that we deal with in the, the Red List of Ecosystems team. That is generally government scientists or even uh, protected area managers. Uh, people are interested in looking at the dynamics of ecosystems in a region on Earth. Um, but generally didn't have the, the uh, technical background or even the computing resources sometimes to be able to uh, develop the maps they need to assess the status of ecosystems. Um, so we set a design brief to, to remove all difficult data decisions. Um, we didn't want to have to um, provide a data download facility. We didn't really want our users to have to think about what sort of classifiers they might want to use or what sort of uh, input data they might want to use for their classification. So really just trying to make everything as simple as possible for 90% of the use cases that we were seeing in, in um, projects that required remote sensing to map the distribution of ecosystems. Uh, and overall, we thought that this sort of workflow should be able to be very quick these days. I mean, with Google Earth Engine uh, and the work that Noel and everyone has done over the last decade, uh, it's really taken out a major component of any remote sensing project, which is data processing and 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 really um, a, an, an enormous time suck that really stops a lot of these projects before they could even start. Uh, next slide, please. So we set out to develop a, a classification workflow that was robust enough to be applied for a whole range of different land cover types. And, and these were generally ecosystems um, from wetlands to forest ecosystems to coastal ecosystems, you know. Um, and we've, we followed a, um, a reasonably well-proven supervised classification workflow, as I've shown here. Generally, we find that our user bases know what they want to classify. They can they can get on Google Earth or on a paper map and show exactly what they want to make a map of. Um, so having those users be able to provide training data to a supervised classifier uh, made a lot of sense to us. Uh, we included a range of um, cloud-free predictor layers for a, for a supervised classification. Um, but not too many. We wanted it to get really quick, quick results. Uh, so there's about 10 or 11 predictors in remap and users can choose which ones they, they want to use. Uh, we apply a random forest classification to it and very quickly return a, um, a result to the app screen. Uh, forward, thanks, Yvonne. So this is remap. It's at, it's at remap.org or remapapp.org. Um, you basically can enter the, enter the site here, search for a place on Earth. Uh, in this case, this is the mangroves of northern Australia. Um, and we set an, an AOI, so it bounds to, to what the analysis can be implemented at. Um, next slide, please. Then the task, basically the main technical task that any user needs to do to be able to, to run a, a remote sensing classification with a random forest is to just provide training data. So in this case, there's a two-class map. This is mangrove or not mangrove. Uh, and we provide guidance on how many training observations are necessary for uh, different situations. Next slide, thanks. We've taken out most of the decisions about the predictor layers that, that we um, predict with, but in this case, I'm showing NDWI, there's also NDVI, next slide, thanks. Uh, and a range of other sort of uh, widely used predictor layers developed from uh, a Landsat Global uh, Cloud-Free Composite. Next slide, thanks. Uh, and then, yeah, then we run, we run a random forest classifier in Earth Engine and return the result to the user. Uh, and as you can see here, we've, we've reasonably successfully mapped the mangroves of this, this area, which is what most protected area managers might want to do around the world, I think, for, for a range of ecosystems that occur in their protected areas. Next slide, thanks. Uh, and one more. And then to sort of 
uh, promote the use of this data in a way that's easy for reporting and things like that. Uh, we we digest the, the outputs that they've developed. And, and in this case, we're providing area estimates. We also compute a, a bunch of uh, standard area metrics that we use in, in red list of ecosystems. Next slide, thanks. Uh, such as the area of occupancy and the extent of occurrence and total area. Next slide, thanks. Uh, and then when we compare the performance of Remap versus some government mapping programs, such as this one here in Australia, um, based on uh, high resolution aerial photography, we find that it, it tends to perform very well. It, it really is a, a question of how much training data a user might want to um, submit to Remap. Uh, and in this case, we've been able to map a, a four-class um, map to the sorts of quality that are used uh, in, in um, compliance and regulations in Australia. Next slide, thanks. So there's a website here at remapapp.org. Uh, get onto it. There's a bunch of tutorials. Um, we're doing a, a, a sort of big update now after three or four years of Remap uh, running in this form. Um, but you can get on there now, you can you can watch tutorials and, and find frequently asked questions to be able to develop these sorts of maps. Uh, and I'll leave it at that because I can see Sam on the side there. Thanks, Nick. Um, no, you're doing good for time, so I've, I've got a few questions for you. Um, do you get contacted by users who are, um, by users or have visibility over who is using Remap? Um, just curious to see who the user base is. Yeah, it's a it's a really good question. Um, we chose not to collect any any user data for Remap. We really wanted to make it um, as freely available as we possibly could. So what we do offer is a is a feedback service. So you can you can provide feedback. So we're not really capturing a bunch of information that would be very very useful, but we thought might might actually. Um, restrict the user base somewhat. So to give you an example of, of the people we know are using it, um, Remap was recently used in, in Myanmar's Red List of Ecosystems project where uh, 65 ecosystems across Myanmar were assessed uh, for their status and, and about 29 of them were identified as, um, as threatened. Uh, it's been used in uh, something like 160 countries, 25,000 users so far. We know how many are being used, but not exactly who they're, who they're, who is using it. And indeed, one of the things we're trying to do with this geo program is to, to solve that problem, basically um, introduce a, a, a sign-in system and, and capture a bit more user data so that we can tweak Remap in a way that we think it might be more useful. But again, it was a, it was a question of um, would, would a protected area manager in... Um, in Cambodia be using this if they had to provide their email and we, we decided not to do that. Yeah, no, and that's, that's an important choice. Um, you know, I think it's all around having having impact in, and getting it used rather than collecting information to answer questions of people like me. Um, so so a lot of the other Geo, um, Geo Google program projects are working towards applications that are really similar in scope to Remap. Um, and I know you did this, you, know, you did most of Remap a while ago now. Um, so do you have any advice to share um, for, to those other projects kind of as they start planning a web application build? Um, Mariano touched on a few points earlier, but I think this is really important for uh, a lot of scientists um, working towards a web application um, aimed at users um, to, to gain a bit of an understanding of the sorts of things they need to think about. Sure. Um... I guess for us, the most useful thing we did right at the very start was, was get our design brief absolutely sorted. Um, it really was the anchor that enabled us to decide on, on questions such as which predictors might we want to use, what sort of models might we want to use. Really having that anchoring point of exactly what we, we want to develop from the, the start mattered. Um, just because it's a field where it's always easy to be sort of distracted and, and and um, move away from the main aim of what you might started might, might have set out to do. Um, beyond that, you know, there's a lot of information we gained from from, um, from the published literature. You know, our, our model was kind of developed having having been remote sensing scientists for for you know several several years, and and that really enabled us to take sort of what's cutting edge science and and adapt it in a way that we thought could meet a user base so diving into what's already been done i think is is really helpful because it can make the process of development much more efficient than trying to do everything from scratch yeah um the other thing i really like about remap as well is that it kind of does one thing but it just does it well um and it looks neat and it's clean 
Um, and I think that adds, adds a fair amount to usability from my point of view anyway. Um, yep. one, more quick, one more quick question uh, before we move on to the next presenter. Um, do you have any plans to um, use Sentinel data as well as Landsat? Yeah, I see that question. Yeah, we, we have a, a development version which, um, which allows a user to input a date and should be able to choose a, a um, sensor type as well. Um, that's something that's on the list of things to do within this program in the, in the next year or so. But, you know, one of the design um, briefs, which I didn't mention, one of the design points was that Remap is uh, sort of designed solely for the purpose of understanding the status of ecosystems. And one of the key things that we need for that is change over time. And so we went with Landsat mainly because it allows us to develop change maps. And Remap does have a historical version where you, you switch a switch and go back to the year 2000 and make exactly the same map um, and can assess change between two time periods. So most of our effort has been in enabling that sort of long-term view of change and, and land cover change over time. So I can understand that we'll get improvements in classification quality with Sentinel, but that might be the cost of, of, um, of long-term change analyses, which is what, what we need, at least for, for many of the global indicators that, um, that we try to, try to support with, with the IUCN Red List of Ecosystems program. Sure. Sure. Um, Nick, thank you. I look forward to continuing the chat in the panel discussion. Uh, next, we have uh, Xiao Song Li from the Aerospace Information Research Institute presenting on land degradation neutrality. Uh, Xiao Song, over to you. Okay, thank you very much. So, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Xiao Song Li from the Aerospace Information Research Institute, CAS. So, uh, firstly, I want to thank for the support of the GEO and the Google. Google. Uh, next. So first of all, I want to introduce some background information. Next. So uh, next. So over the uh, a lot of the the uh, SDG indicators, we can see uh, from the tier the classification, we can see there's the some indicators with no measured and the no date. Uh, and for the SDG next, uh, the 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 bigger state is a key source of the SDGs. Next, which could provide a lot of the data source from the space, from the airborne and the ground uh, and the institute data. Next. So we can see uh, for the SDG fifteen point three point five. There's the big difference in the status of the uh, these SDG indicators. We can see the the numbers uh, code range from the two uh, two per five or the the three three per four and the, for the fifteen percent and the one third. Uh, this big the difference is is mainly uh, because of the the definition and the baseline of the uh, land degradation. And this will lead to the big variations in the numbers. Next. So we can see there's a lot of progress of the land degradation assessment. Uh, next. I, I think this is uh, the old version. Please, please change next. So for the, the SDG 50.3 assessment, we can see there's a, a sense the, the framework existed, but uh, no practice, especially the globally consistent and the comparable results, uh, because which fits the risk of political and technological uncertainty, and the progress is uh, slow. Also from the 15.3.1 to the land degradation neutrality is necessary to the balance the degradation and the restoration. And the secondly, the, the, there's a, a, a serious lack of the data, which uh, seriously hinders the understanding of the current status of the SDGs. So it's urgent to leverage on the remote sensing to fill the gaps under the framework of the SDGs. Next. 
So uh, the second part, I want to our team the contribution to the SDG. If you hope I can understand another language, please. Next. Next. So uh, this is our team. It's it's a cast strategic pioneer the product. It's it's a lot of the the institutes institutes involved. Next. This is the Castro's framework. It's mainly based on the, the different data source, then construct the big data and the cloud services, then to support the, the SDG works. Next. This is our the open data uh, sharing system. Next. So this slide shows how to we support the SDG indicators from the SDG two to SDG fifteen. Next. Also, this is the technology facilitation the mechanism, and our chief scientist is one of the ten members of this uh, mechanism. Next one. Okay. Uh, so how, how to contribute to the SDG? We will uh, uh, focus on the data products, uh, the modeling method, and the decision support. This is how, how we want to contribute to the SDGs. Next. Also, our, our work on the uh, big data in support of the SDGs has been adopted by the Chinese government to submit to the UN assembly the each year. Next. So the third, uh, the third section, I want to uh, introduce some of the preliminary, the, the evalu evaluation of the LDN. Next. In fact, there's a lot of uh, three the sub indicators of the SD 15.3.1. Uh, in this section, I, I just want to focus on the land productivity change. Next. Uh, next. So uh, uh, for the uh, SDG 50.3.1, the evaluation, we use a lot of the dates. For the land productivity, the change, we use the different uh, the vegetation indicators, such as the enhanced vegetation index, the normalized the, the different vegetation index, also the net primary uh, productivity and the leaf error index. So why we use so many indicators? Because the, the, uh, there's the not sure which indicator is best for the reflect the Land productivity change. So our idea is to uh, combine all the available the vegetation in the indicators to establish a, a new land productivity change. The product. Next. Uh, next is for the land cover. Next. And this is it for the soil organic uh, uh, the matter. Next. So this is for the, 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 the framework of the new land productivity change, the product. So because we use the four the global the vegetation indicators, we will check and identify the consistency between these four indicators. Then we will classify them into the low confidence, the medium confidence, and the high confidence. When all the indicators uh, shows the same the, the, the trend, we will give them a high confidence. Uh, this this uh, is the same for the, the, the medium confidence. When one or uh, one, two or three the indicators show the, the same trend, then, then the, it's, it will be defined as a medium confidence. Uh, when only one indicator show the, the trend, uh, but other indicators show the stable trend, we will define as the low confidence. Next. So from this slide, we can see the, the, the trend, the analysis of the global vegetation indicators. We can see there's a, 
a huge difference between the different indicators selected. Next. Yes, this is the, for the, the four indicators. So next. So this, this uh, slide shows how uh, the, the result of we combined all the four indicators with the different the confidence from the low confidence to the high confidence. So if you want to uh, take the, the most strict uh, rules, you can select the high confidence the indicators which means the, the four indicators, all the four vegetation indicators show the same rules. Also, we analyze the, 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 the different performance in the different climate zones and in, into the different the land covers. Next. So this map is the, the, the final the, the, uh, land degradation and the recovery map uh, by combining uh, this the new land productivity change product and the other, other products, we can see the, the some of the hot spots for the land degradation and the the, uh, the recovery regions. Next, so we de developed the GE based the tracking tools uh, online with the, this the. Uh, Land productivity, new products, also the the some of the climate the correction the measures was included. Next, so in the next so in the in the future, we will refine the measures and the the data sets such as the global uh, thirty meters consistent the land covers the climate calibration on the land productivity indicators and the large scale, the top soil, the soil organic matter dynamic assessment. Also, we will enhance the international cooperation with the UN agencies and the, the interested countries to validate and interpret the primary results. Also, we will provide the key data sets and the toolbox based on the GE, the platform. Next. Okay, thank that's you. all, thank you very much. Uh, Song, thank you very much uh, for that presentation. Um, I, the work that you've presented here shows a an incredible amount of effort and investment um, that has been made in this area um, and, and a lot of those frameworks and the processes that you've defined would be very valuable to others. Um, when and how do you plan to share this information? Uh, yes, we, we, uh, we would like to share the, the key data sets about the sub indicators of the SDG 15.3.1. Firstly, we, we would provide the data set on the GE. It, it's it's the public, the uh, shareable for the everyone uh, we, we, who can use this platform. Uh, now we are we are uh, uh, adjusting the some the codes of the, the GE the the interface. So uh, later we will open uh, the, the link to all the users to share these informations. Also, uh, you can see in our the team, we have a data share, the, the database, the sharing the system. Uh, we will publish our the data set in the, our the data sharing system when we we'll download it from the, our system. Yeah, excellent. Excellent. Um, thank you. Um, just in the interest of time, I'll save my next questions for you for the panel presentation. Um, Cao Song, thanks for your presentation. Thank Our you. next presenter is Alejandro Coco Castro from the Instituto Geografico Augustin Cadazzi presenting on multi temporal change detection. Um, over to you, Alejandro. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for the invitation. And today, on behalf of, of this project, uh, GEO, Multitemporal Change Detection, and uh, a great team and researcher and consultant, IDGAT. Uh, next. 
maybe for those that are not familiar with IGAT, IGAT is the major national authority on geography and cartography. And we have the uh, great uh, largest database about cadaster real estate uh, information, so data, geographic research, production, communication, and access to geography information. And we are also uh, helping with geography knowledge transfer and training capacity building in Colombia and in the region. That's okay. That um, very important to say uh, here is that uh, as we are developing agency in Colombia, we have the largest national catalog of very high resolution images and aerial photographs that can be accessed through a browser. And we are going to provide the link uh, there in, in the YouTube and uh, in the comments, next. And uh, what we are doing with this catalog, um, uh, probably we should uh, uh, we did a uh, kind of uh, approach that we are using the geo license. Uh, first, it's important to say that the Colombia now have this multi-purpose cadastre policy, which is the major transforming uh, uh, policy regarding land information and tenure. And it's an instrument for peace, post-conflict reconstruction by making available accurate and updated information on the location, ownership, value, and use of each parcel. This is not only for uh, taxation. We are also, uh, because it's a multi-purpose, as the name says, it, it, ha it, it aims to help other sectors, NGOs, civil society working with uh, environmental information and trying to have a very detailed information. Just this is the map of Colombia. And uh, the current, uh, by 2020, by 2025, we aim to have a 100% coverage of land information in Colombia. Currently, it's only 6%. Next. So, uh, to, in order to contribute to this uh, policy and using GEO, we, as a team at, at IGAT, uh, we are uh, aiming to migrate this uh, National Band of Image catalog from local to cloud-based environment using uh, the L engine technology and the cloud of the Google products. And second, evaluating the feasibility of the L engine for multi-temporal studies. We are running very uh, short-term projects. And using these uh, images what, that we have in the cloud, and at the end, we uh, aim to contribute to this national policy. Next. Um, uh, just to uh, show you here, uh, uh, we have developed as part of these three months projects, so NATS, and this one is about coverage vectorization. And this helps us to create basic layers for this uh, multipurpose cluster. We have uh, here an example, and using very high resolution images, less than uh, a, a meter. And we are uh, using existing layers that we have at the Institute to create the samples. And here we are going to see this is one of the layers that we have at the institute, and we are exploiting these layers to create new maps. And of course, users can, according to the image, uh, improve the results. And we have developed this kind of apps to accelerate the production of uh, some coverage like water bodies, forests, highways, roads that are essential for the policy. And here we are just have to wait because it's producing the results of one of the algorithms that is a supervised classification, in this case, random forest. So as part of the layer that we produce, we have the, the raw data, then the post-classified post, post raster, and at the end, we produce vector, vector layers that the users can upload in a GIS software. Next. And uh, this is another example of an uh, app that we have developed in, in, such, in such short period of time uh, uh, using other, uh, very high resolution data. In this case, we are challenging uh, the, the capability of Air Engine to use deep learning models. And here, uh, you're showing an area that we know that we have some chain according to some, some reference layers that we have there. And we are testing some of the integration of TensorFlow and deep learning models in this case because building chain detection, the traditional supervised su classifiers are not that good. So we, are, we developed this app with deep learning models to predict in time one and in time two uh, images. And then we, to create, to detect the chain, we just made the difference between the classified images. So here we see that the deep learning model uh, it, ca it, it have a good correspondence with the uh, with the with the image. So this kind of information uh, is a, a kind of a start that helps us to create this information in a 
very uh, efficient way. And we are exploiting the capabilities uh, for of the air engine to produce this information. Uh, here you said in the red areas, those areas that change it uh, in, in that particular area of the study. And, and again, we can export those layers to any uh, GIS software. Next. And yes, that, that was a, a very quick intro of our project. As I say, uh, we have these uh, challenges and we have this policy of helping uh, for uh, this uh, multi-purpose uh, cadaster uh, uh, information that we need to generate. So we are meant to continue exploiting the uh, National Band of Image Catalog for other uh, uh, uses like uh, an application like building state mapping field boundary detection, property value estimation, object detection, infrastructure mapping and monitoring, and of course, uh, trying to do some, some multi-sensor function, uh, radar and some other kind of application with the aim to contribute to this uh, policy that essentially uh, is, is covering many SDGs like poverty, like land degradation, and also as you see, peace and uh, inclusive societies. So this is a very important project that, and thank you everyone. Next slide. And thank you everyone. That's the contact that we have in case you have any question about this project. As I say, it's very exciting to be here. And um, thank you. Alejandro, thank you. Um, great presentation. Um, uh, I'm really impressed by how far and how fast you you and your team have developed um, in the use of Earth Engine, um, particularly your application of TensorFlow for um, you know predictions within an application like that. That's that's excellent. Um, but I'm I'm interested in your thoughts around how well how well Earth Engine is a fit or how Earth Engine helps you with kind of that fundamental capacity building task of um, building. Um, building a national cadaster because it's it's a huge and challenging exercise, but at the same time that information is is really important for effective administration. So, how are you finding Google Earth Engine contributing to the efforts there? Uh, I mean, is uh, we have some divisions internally at the GATS. Uh, one of them is the cartography division, and they are using very traditional software to update this information. We are proposing these apps to accelerate. And as I say, we have a huge amount of images that uh, we are we need to process at, at that at that scale uh, with certain standards to produce the information. So through Google Air Engine, we have found that is very important uh, to develop this kind of app because users don't need to go to the commercial software on local mm -hmm. uh, machines. Uh, it can accelerate everything on the cloud on the fly. So it's definitely a thing that we're doing. And in terms of capacity building, we have created some uh, users manual to help the divisions to exploit the, the tools and apps. So definitely it's a Google Air Engine with the, especially with the uh, maps, uh, the apps app, uh, uh, development is a great, I guess it's a great approach that we are taking to another level. Fantastic. Um, I'm interested also in the National Bank of Images. Is that kind of open access to Colombians or, yeah, how, how do people access that? Make so those images are, uh, I mean, we have this uh, multi-institutional license. So basically that is the is curating all these images that the government has uh, bought, uh, brought, bought to companies. And essentially, uh, people can only visualize the area of interest, and then uh, they contact us as a guide because we are the curators of those images, and we can, according to the license, provide them those images. Yes. But with the with this kind of approach that we are migrating them to the cloud, we hopefully uh, we would like to make that more uh, open to institutions in IT way. That's our aim. Thank you. Thank you Excellent. for the um, Alejandro, thanks for your presentation. Look forward to uh, you joining us on the panel um, after Charles. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Um, our final presenter is Charles Mwangi from the Kenyan, uh, sorry, the Kenya Space Agency, presenting on monitoring for information and decisions using space technology. Charles, love to hear your um, presentation. 
Uh, thank you, Sam. Um, thank you for having me on this uh, wonderful uh, discussion. So uh, I will be presenting on uh, monitoring for information and decisions using space technology, which is essentially leveraging on the use of uh, Google Earth Engine, uh, one to build capacity as well as uh, leverage on the, uh, the free and open resources that are available on the platform. Uh, to inform decisions um, uh, that are made by policymakers. Next. So um, the, uh, the project meets is essentially um, an initiative of the Kenya Space Agency whose uh, mandate is essentially to promote, uh, coordinate and regulate um, space activities with the, within the country. So the drive is essentially to uh, involve our stakeholders uh, to uh, learn how to develop applications, uh, learn how to use open source uh, tools that are available out there for uh, the decision making next. So the aspiration of the project is, uh, like I mentioned, uh, to use uh, free, freely and open uh, source data that is available, as well as systems like Google, Google Earth Engine to uh, develop uh, uh, systems that um, would be would be informative for the policymakers to uh, make decisions. Uh, the idea is to uh, initially uh, depend on only of the resources that are available on the platform, uh, because that would ensure that someone who is in in, in different locations across the country will be able to uh, use the tool uh, and be able to develop output. So we have um, three main focus areas. Uh, uh, one will be on forest, that is one that is ongoing and we're almost on the tail end of that. Uh, the other element that will kick in will be urbanization and then we look at the flood, uh, floods and landslides. So the idea is to develop pilot cases where we demonstrate what uh, the capabilities of Google Earth Engine is so that again the, uh, the stakeholders who are in, in those uh, spheres are able to adopt uh, some of the tools and be able to use that for decision making. Next. Next, please. So uh, forest mopping um, uh, was, was essentially, uh, the idea was driven by uh, the requirement of uh, our constitution that requires that we maintain um, a tree cover of about 10%. And um, that has been a challenge for some of the government institutions that are mandated to monitor that. So we thought of using Google Earth Engine as a tool where um, uh, the, the institutions or even the, uh, the county governments that are also have a stake um, in, in, in monitoring how much uh, forest we have within the country uh, to, to use a tool that they can, they, they, they are able to see the back end as well as be able to query and make uh, changes where necessary as well as understand the potential of, of um, using ad observation to inform the decision and be able to also save costs because one of the key, key challenges in, 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 in the developing countries is the resources that are required in terms of uh, the hardware, the software that you need to, uh, to, to buy for you to be able to, uh, to, to process uh, satellite imagery. Next, please. So we uh, we were very intentional in terms of uh, who uh, we would have in, within the team because essentially uh, we wanted to build capacity across different institutions in terms of how how they can use the tool for decision making. So we reached out to different uh, agencies um, who have a stake um, in, in terms of monitoring the forest as uh, uh, provided for in that slide. Next, please. So um, the process that we've been following is essentially um, uh, uh, we're using a simple approach so that uh, anyone who is in that space would be able to follow the process and again, leverage on the potential that um, again, the resources that you have on the Google Earth Engine is uh, quite immense. Next. Uh, so uh, the slide shows the workflow uh, where we look at um, uh, the imagery and then uh, you process that until um, where you have the uh, the final product. So uh, one of the key elements, like I mentioned, is to uh, be able to understand how much tree cover we have 
uh, as a country, also at the county level. So the stats will be essential. Um, again, also monitor how much forest uh, we're losing and how, or how much forest you're gaining. Again, we have different categories of the forest, um, uh, which again, uh, much of this uh, has been informed by the, by the needs of uh, the stakeholders who are essentially working in this field. And then also do a time series where we are able to show how, how the forest cover within the country has evolved over time. Next. So we've, um, we, we are um, exploring using two sources of data. We are working with certain uh, two data and then we're also working with Landsat uh, 8 data. And we have identified a region where, uh, which is called the Abadea Forest, where we are piloting this uh, study. And uh, you have um, a map that indicates the sections. Um, and this was a pre uh, classification image that we did before we went to do the ground truthing. So essentially the product that we'll be able to generate will be in line with the, uh, the forest and land forest classes and then uh, be able to categorize to the level of uh, whether we have natural forest, plantation forest, or uh, bamboo forest within that ecosystem. Next. So for the ground truthing, we, uh, we did it. Um, we had three teams, again, using the stakeholders as part of the team. So uh, again, building capacity uh, in terms of how you collect data and then the processes, and then of course, learning from the challenges that you experience in the field. And um, we were also using open source um, tools uh, for, for mapping. We were using ODK. Uh, collect for uh, for data collection. Also, we had uh, the GPSs, but I, essentially we were trying to leverage on using tools that are freely available um, uh, out there for 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 uh, to enable uh, anyone who might not have the uh, the funds to uh, to do uh, a very elaborate um, uh, uh, study. Next, please. So th that was some uh, uh, some of the um, images that we got when we. Uh, we did the ground clothing. Again, um, quite interesting because you get to experience different different um, ecosystems and also get to enjoy the, the beauty that um, uh, our mother nature bequeaths to us. Next. So um, the other element that we are, uh, we are uh, developing is the user interface and um, uh, very much soon the app. So the idea is um, to, to provide a platform where a policy maker who might not uh, be uh, be well versed in the scripting um, uh, is able to query the system and be able to generate the stats. At the same time, the idea is to provide, uh, to develop the script and provide it to any, any GIS uh, user who uh, is working in the different levels of uh, government institutions uh, so that now they can, they can use a script, they can decide to amend it, they can decide to um, uh, improve on it, so that again, uh, at the end of it, uh, we have a scenario where we have more, more people within the government using uh, the, the tools, again, using the, uh, the, the, the products that have been generated to inform decisions. Next, please. So uh, we are on the tail end, uh, like I mentioned, of uh, developing um, uh, the, uh, the final product for the, for the forest. Um, again, we will get to the pace where we we fine tune the, the, the composite image, uh, the, the user interface, and as well as the, the app. Uh, we're working on the classification and the accuracy assessment to see how well uh, the results we're getting matches to what uh, has been provided. And I'm, I'm quite excited about the, some of the app that I've seen within, uh, within this presentation, which we'll essentially use for cross-checking whether whatever you're getting is, it meets a particular aggression. And again, essentially we will work out on um, or a paper to publish what we have come up with. And, and of course, the final report um, for this subphase is, is, is already in the progress. And then next, we are going to embark on, uh, on developing um, applications on urbanization. Next, please. So that, that is um, a very nice image of the upper days taken using a drone, uh, which shows um, the canopy cover of, uh, of the upper days uh, region. And um, again, I, uh, I'm, I'm really grateful for, for Sam and the team for the support that they, they've been offering, especially in terms of the training, because that builds capacity also for the team and, and they're able to understand much more in terms of uh, how to use the tools and also for the group, uh, group on other observation 
for this opportunity as well as uh, the Google Earth engine for offering this platform, which is uh, very essential for, for developing countries and uh, for users who might not have all the resources. Thank you. Sir. Charles, thank you. Um, great presentation. It's, um, I, was, I was really interested um, in the aspects of your presentation discussing the capacity building, um, you know, because I know that from our conversations um, a, a few months ago that it's for the Kenyan Space Agency a, a, a component of building your science team and, and also building their capacity and, and more broadly expanding that capacity to understand I interpret and make good use of Earth observations. Um, so where, where, what are the key ways that Google Earth Engine or this program or GEO are, are really contributing to capacity development in, um, in Kenya? What are, what are the most important things that we might take away and, and, and try to um, apply elsewhere? So um, um, the, the element of... Um, Having um, pre-processed um, uh, imagery, especially within the Google Earth platform, is a big win because uh, it saves um, uh, uh, the the stakeholders or the the users a lot of times in terms of uh, uh, downloading scenes, having to process them. So it, it's quite interesting, and the feedback that I get, especially from the team that I mentioned, and we have been having ongoing discussions. We had that discussion also with um, with you and your team in terms of what it meant for us. Uh, and and, and it, I can say from the few months that we've um, we've been have, having this running, I see the excited, uh, excitement levels because um, we, we're providing a solution that is less taxing to, to the user, um, easy to understand. Um, uh, even if you're not a remote scientist, uh, you'll still be able to develop and again, also in terms of um, uh, providing a resource that any other person can develop an application on. So uh, ours is not essentially to uh, develop a cutting edge uh, application. We hope to have a platform that um, will be will be um, will be the Google Earth Engine uh, that will be working um, to, from the Google Earth, Earth Engine platform. But essentially, to reach out even to uh, the students who are working in the university, uh, who are studying in the university, to give, tell them you can have a tool that you can develop even applications for for for, for sustainers or for um, as startups, because again, those are areas where we see a lot of growth. Yeah, excellent. Um, Charles, thank you. Um, please stay with us and I'll ask the um, other presenters to rejoin us as, as panelists. Um, if if anybody who is watching um, or a, a attending this meetup at the moment has a question for the panelists, please post that um, in the comments box, and I'll and I'll pass that through to the panel. Um, while we're waiting for that, though, I'm interested to know um, if if you guys could change one thing about Google Earth Engine, what would it be? Um, I'll start with you, um, Nick. You've been using Earth Engine for a long time now. If you could change one thing. Um, gee, that's a hard question. Probably, um, you know, I know a lot of people want more space to store their assets. I think that's probably one thing that everyone will ask for if they can get it. Um, yeah. But, you know, so maybe if we can buy space if we need more space. Yeah. Excellent. Good response. Um, Mariano, I'll, I'll pass the same question to you. You've been using it a long time. Hmm. Um, one issue that we have found is sort of running multiple tasks. I mean, I, I get we got we got ambitious with Google Earth Engine and it raised the bar so much that we want even more. So sometimes we have to create several accounts in order to some run some analysis in parallel. So I guess having that option to expand the processing of some accounts could be a good one. Uh, but again, being overly Google Earth Engine changed the way that we work in such significant ways that it's a minor us relative to the huge improvement. Yeah, excellent, great. Um, and and Doug, before we started today, uh, we were talking about um, soil carbon and and is anyone measuring it? Um, would you uh, like to ask your question of the panel around soil carbon? Yeah, I I was um, unsure how many of you were directly um, looking at 
the assessment of the sub the third sum ind indicator under 15.3.1 on uh, soil organic carbon, which I think is the most difficult one to estimate um, correctly or, or with any degree of, of accuracy. Um, so I just was curious, um, you know, in your projects, if you're doing that, um, how satisfied are you with the results and 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 what uh, kinds of data would you like to see that that you don't currently have to to get a better handle on that? I guess Mariano, that's kind of directed at you. <laughs> yeah, I can take it first. How about that? Uh, yeah, as you know, that what we're doing is we're using sort of the, the IPCC recommendation, the baseline one, which is using land cover to inform changes in soil organic carbon, but. As, as you all know, that is not really measuring changes in solar organic carbon. So I think uh, any improvements in, in that and, and, and solar organic carbon is tricky because even collecting the field data is challenging. You need time series, you need a good spatial resolution, given that uh, spatial distribution, given that soil uh, is so heterogeneous. So having ways to actually measure those changes instead of inferring them from changes in land covers would be a huge improvement for, for, for land degradation monitoring and in general for anything, for agriculture, for restoration, for climate change mitigation. So, yeah. Uh, Sam. Yes. Uh, maybe yes. I have to say something. Uh, in our situation, we are also, because we have the largest soil information in Colombia, we have some partnership with FAO, FAO and uh, for instance, uh, uh, we are not using Google Air Engine for this purpose. Everything is in R, but uh, I found that the Google Air Engine have a large potential to probably to uh, do more large scale analysis because every, everything that we have produced the organic soil map in Colombia is in R. So definitely Google Air Engine is the next step that we can thinking the NSGR project. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, actually, Alejandro, the, my next question was for you. Um, so what, in terms of a, achieving your objective, and I think it was to have um, the cadaster of Columbia complete by 2025, what do you see as the, the main barrier that you're going to need to overcome to achieve that objective? Yeah, probably I, I didn't have the time, enough time to explain everything, but this is multi-institutional effort. It's not just EGAT. So we have different, I mean, uh, components, not just physical components to measure. Also, there are like uh, economical components that we have to develop. So there are many challenges, challenges because it's multi-institutional. So in terms of technologies, we have this great offer of Google Air Engine tools, but we also need to think about in situ methodologies and collaborative technology like citizen science. So there are many challenges, and I guess it's a very short period of time, but we hope that all this integration of different approaches can help us to, to do this 100% land information in Colombia. And I think that land planning is a very important step to do these land degradation studies. If you don't have a very good land planning, of course, you will have problems with land degradation. So this policy aims to help to this uh, SDG goal of uh, land degradation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, excellent. Um, and Doug, I'd like to throw the next question for you to, for you to ask if you'd like to. I'm happy yeah. for this to be a conversation. Yeah. Yeah, sure. No, um, I, I just was intrigued by something that George said towards the end of his presentation, and that was how important it was uh, to have these pre-processed data sets on Google Earth Engine. So, you know, another way another way that we call those are analysis-ready data sets, you know, um, and CEOS, the Community on Earth Observation Satellites, is producing um, a steady stream of analysis-ready data for land um, land surface. Um, but CIOS is also discussing producing other types of ARD. And I was just kind of curious, in your projects, are there other types of analysis-ready data, you know, like, I don't know, sea surface temperature or something along those lines that would be useful for you? That's just any 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 thought, you know, because I, I, I I'll, the reason behind that is I'm the liaison between the Secretariat and CIOS. So I... 
you know, I will um, at our next discussion, I will, I'll mention that we had this 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 talk this uh, this talk, and I would like to uh, give them some ideas. I mean, they're looking at 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 other possibilities, but it's not easy to do. So I'm just kind of curious what what kinds of analysis ready data would be interesting for you. We, uh, I think for the, the other the ready used dates, I think maybe the the updates, the land cover dates, or the some of the semantics the data sets will be important for the, uh, the 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 research on the land. I think so. Uh, I think maybe most of people are, are work on the land. So the about the sea surface, the temperature, or the other things. Uh, maybe not so important in this group, I think, but I do believe it's very important for the other peoples. Um, excellent. Um, so Song, did you, I uh, saw you raise your hand before, did you have another uh, question to ask or, uh, or comment to make? Uh, in fact, I want to follow the question of the doc about the, the soil organic matter the mapping. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, in our product, we designed the, the SOM, the mapping for the arid land, because uh, we think uh, uh, for these regions, the, the vegetation is not so much. Uh, some of the bare land could be uh, observed directly by the satellites. So we try to use the uh, Sentinel-1, the SADIT, and the Satina 2 dates to, to combine with the machine learning measure to the uh, produce the top soil, the soil organic matter, the, uh, the mapping. Uh, but uh, 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 major the, the problem is when we uh, 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 extend the research regions. Uh, especially at the regional or the global scale, we, we, we lack the, the field, the true states uh, with the same time, I think. That's a major the obstacle for, the, for the, this work, I think. If the, the geo could uh, uh, coordinate for the, some consistent the, the field truth, the, the data set collections, I think it will be greatly the, the interesting for all the peoples i think yeah that that's um that's a um a critical issue um again um in talking with um gfy the global forest observation initiative um they are suggesting a biomass uh network to do this very thing for for biomass you know to uh to have a a, a dense or as dense as possible in situ network to drink ground truth what they're de deriving from remote sense so this could be another area that that geo could take up, um, trying to estimate, uh, you know, at least sur surface soil organic stocks, um, and then have a, an in, in, in situ field campaign to verify that. So that's a very interesting point. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. No, great. Great contribution. Thank you. Um, well, just looking at the time, um, I think that's going to have to be our last question for today, this evening. Um, so. Firstly, I'd like to thank everybody who has presented and also Noel and Doug, um, really appreciate um, you giving the time to talk about your projects, to share your experiences. Um, and I hope that you can all benefit. Um, and now that you've all met, those of you, hadn't, those of you who hadn't already met, um, I hope those connections enable you to continue sharing ideas and um, yeah, continuing the conversation. So the recording for this meetup will be made public on YouTube soon. Um, look out for the link in your inboxes um, and also on social media um, and I definitely encourage you to share that with your colleagues or share it via your social media networks or other networks, feel free. Um, and finally, for all the attendees and everybody who's watching this video at a more convenient time, um, time zone, um, thank you for, for watching. Um, we've got two more virtual, uh, sorry, we've got one more virtual meetup um, that you're welcome to join as well. Um, that will be um, in about 23 hours time and our focus um, then will be on agriculture and poverty alleviation. Um, we hope you can all join us then. Thank you.